BC fishing industry with Brian Bison and Michael Bernia, um, hosted by Ships to Shores. I'm Rochelle, and I'm the vice chairperson. And before we continue on, I'm going to do a quick land acknowledgement. So while we meet today on a virtual platform, we would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands we are on today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Ships to Shores aims to encourage collective introspection about the current relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities as First Peoples, as Canadians, as members of coastal communities, and as people in the marine sector. So I mentioned Ships to Shores, and so I'm going to explain a little bit about who we are. So we are a pan-Canadian initiative, so we work all the way across Canada from the west coast to the east. And we're created by the Broadreach Foundation with support of the gov from the Government of Canada. And our project aims to engage 2,000 youth across Canada in activities focused on the Canadian green sector through like arts and culture, economic activities, so like what's happening in terms of jobs and professions, civic engagement, like how can we protect our waterways, and history and heritage. And so most of our activities due to COVID-19 have been digital, like this webinar. But we also have a sailing access fund and a coastal challenge. And you can find more information for both of those on our website at shiptoshores.ca. So getting to our presenters, we have Brian Robertson and Michael Pernia. Um, So Brian is a Vancouver-based musician and he has been described as a genuine sea treasure. He is best known for his authentic and well-crafted songs about the region and history. He was born and raised in Powell River on the west coast of Canada. And he has worked as a fisherman, mill worker, a savage driver, cabbie engineer, economist, a uh, historical consultant. Based on his experience in these fields, he has created two CDs that's called Chuck, Serengeet, and Times and Places. And Michael is a prestigious young fiddler who has been to the BC Open Fiddle, or who was, yeah, Fiddle Championship twice and has been a finalist in the prestigious Canadian Grandmasters Fiddle Championship. He is a much sought after accompanist and music instructor, and he and Brian have been making music together for over a decade. He has a CD of his own of fiddle tunes under title of A Sense of Tradition. So I will pass it off to the two of you. Hope everyone enjoys. Hey, thanks very much, Raquel. Um, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this uh, little program that Michael and I have put together. Um, we just jump right into it. We've got a lot of stuff to do. Um, so I want you to think about, um, uh, we're out on the West Coast and uh, our environment is dominated by the ocean. So let's, let's uh, just start everything by going out on the ocean. And Michael and I are going to do a little fiddle tune of that very same name. fishing resources that we uh, are concerned about on the BC coast come from, salmon primarily. And uh, of course, they're what's called an anadromous species. They, they spend much of their lives in the ocean and then they return to the rivers to spawn. So if I can refer to this map, 
they're out here growing up. And they come in, swimming past places like Haida Gwaii, Vancouver Island, and along the coast. And there's just a myriad of salmon-bearing rivers all along the coast. But these are the major ones. I thought I'd put a lines on the coast, on the, on the map, to show just where some of these big rivers are. This one that dominates this whole area here is the Fraser, which many of you are pretty familiar with. This is the Stikine, the Nass, and this one, although I don't have a whole map to show it, is the Columbia. And it rises along the Rockies, goes way down into Washington State, forms the boundary between Washington State and Oregon, and comes out into the ocean <clears throat> down around here. And all of these rivers have all the kinds of fish, all the kinds of salmon. And I just wanted to say that the salmon are so important to the coast because everything is dependent on it. It's what ecologists call a keystone species. Um, they have found that, that much of the um, nitrogen that is in the forests along the BC coast has been brought in by the salmon. They go up the rivers, they, get, they spawn or they get caught by bears and eagles, and their remains get spread all over the place and become food for the entire food chain, when, whether we're talking about little critters in the, in the rivers or um, worms and fungi in the forest that they all find wind up in the trees. So it's an incredibly important um, <clears throat> uh, species for our coastal ecology. And there's, as many of you know, especially <clears throat> a special welcome, I should say, to those students from Port Alberni, as many of you know for sure, um, there are quite a few species of salmon that come in. We have uh, the biggest uh, are the Chinook. Sometimes in BC we call them springs because they can spawn in the spring or the fall. They're unique that way. So we call them springs. And they were incredibly important to First Nations who uh, would have first fish ceremonies in the spring that represented the first coming of salmon for them, those first spawning spring Chinooks. And uh, they're quite large. They get from three kilos to over 40 kilos. And they spend a good part of their time, the bigger fish spend a good part of their time inshore after coming from the ocean to get really large. Then the sockeye, the famous sockeye, the reds, uh, <clears throat> commercially probably the most important, and uh, they need lakes to uh, to for their for their fish to grow up in as smolts, and then they go out to sea. So this all these fish migrate up the rivers. Then they as when the eggs hatch and they develop into what's called smolts, they go down the rivers and back out to sea. Um, Coho are maybe my favorite. I like to think of them as, as almost like warriors or kamikazes of, of the salmon species. Uh, farmers will find them finning across their flooded fields sometimes. They're so, so active and looking for places to spawn. Then there are uh, pinks, which the fishermen call humpies. Um, small fish, but probably the best eating if you get them right out of the water. Um, but unfortunately, those ones uh, degrade quite quickly. But they're, they're a wonderful fish to eat right out of the water. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a kayaker, and sometimes I've been able to get my hands on a fresh uh, pink salmon and cook it on the beach, and it's just the best thing. And then there's the chum salmon, which uh, fishermen also call dog salmon, because when they spawn, they go up the rivers, and their heads deform, and they get these huge fangs. So they... They remind people of dogs, so they call them dog salmon. So we're going to do a, a song written by Fraser Lang, which kind of incorporates some of these kinds of things. It's called the Salmon Circle, and it goes something like this. Oh, the salmon circle from the sea to the sea, up the rivers of life, endlessly, and they always return the place they began for a million years. They swam and swam and swam. On the rocks and the pools in the river below, they are turning and turning. Oh, so slow, sad and better forever in the sacred dance. On the ground they go, it's 
a wonderful man. A long, slow rhythm of a four-year cycle to the pounding beat of the oceans that are like the drum that sounds clear across the globe. It's calling the children, calling them home. And the sad and circle from the sea to the sea of the rivers of life endlessly, and they always return to the place they began. For a million years, they swam and swam and swam. Red backs, swimming in the stream. Blue backs, dancing in a dream. Nose to tail, they circle round and round. Going back to the back, back to the spawning ground. By the taste of the water, they return to the source. They found their eggs and feel the life force. Resting safe in the gravel below. That's the winter through and spring life renews. And the sand and circle from the sea to the sea. The rivers of life endlessly, and they always return. The place they began for a million years, they swam and swam and swam. They swam and swam and swam. Well, that's the Salmon Circle by Fraser Lang. So, when I get into the, the, the actual salmon fishing, I'm going to start with uh, trolling. And uh, Trolling, uh, especially again, um, you kids on the on the west coast will recognize that a salmon trolling boat has these big poles, and they bring them out like that and put out lines, and uh, the lines have uh, hooks on them and with lures, and and the fish are attracted to the lures. And um, modern trolling boats have uh, uh, what are called girdies, and they're like power reels, uh, so that the Fisherman doesn't have to hand haul these fish in. He can haul them in more efficiently using the power of the boat's engine. Um, there's a lot of definitions that uh, go into trawling that are probably worth my explaining because of the next song that I'm going to do it has a lot of what we call jargon, um, the terms that are highly specialized. Of course, we have poles. I told you about girdies. Um, when the fish strike the lure, there are line springs on springs that are like, uh, they absorb the, the impact of the fish hitting the, the lures. Those springs will bounce. Um, they're attached to the pole, but they're also attached to bells. And those bells will ring and tell the fishermen that there is a fish on the line to be pulled up. And then one other term I want to use uh, well, several actually. Um, one is pigs, and pigs are floats that are trailed behind the boat to help separate lines. Um, and finally, um, the trollers are primarily interested in catching Chinook and coho salmon. Um, they're beautiful fish that um, are, uh, they feed on the kinds of things that, that um, allure mimics, like herring. And uh, <clears throat> So I, I want to do a, a song by uh, another a West Coast fisherman um, named Ken Ham, um, and this is based on his experiences um, trolling for salmon on the outside uh, of uh, Haida Gwaii near a place called Hippa, Hippa Island. And uh, so I hope you can make, uh, make heads and tails of, of this song. It's got a lot of jargon in it, but it's a fun song. It's early in the morning. It's four o'clock and we're on our way. And we're looking for Smiley, but he can't be found. It's on the fishing ground. And we tacked up his butt in a dirty lot. Uh, the pigs were bouncing, and you could see them jump. With the cold southeaster, 
right in your face. And a three days skunkin' man that sunk his grace on the vision brown, on Smiley's trail, a down around a hip hop in a rising gale, on the fishing grounds on Smiley's trail. Well, we ain't quitting till we got fish for sale. Well, we fished it low and we fished it deep. And a medium red now, that's our only key. Put the 30 pounder with a real good bite. But when we got to the poor Lord, it was just a white. And we fished it down, oh yeah, we fished it down. At 20 fathoms, that's a fishy ground. But there's nothing but shrimp there and no damn birds. Well, to me, where's smiling? That's all I heard on the fishing ground. On Smiley's trail, down around the hip in a rising gale. On the fishing grounds of Smiley's trail. Well, we ain't been to be got fish for sale. No luck on the rascals, no luck on the crow. We were thinking of the pleasures, all the pleasures of home. But there's nothing but no go here, too early to sell. We're just staring at the last spring, waiting on the bell. And the darn old rock dog, twisting up our lives. We're shaking these coho men, I'm wasting my time. Let me go ahead and log in, build me up a raft. Tow it all in charm and sell it quick for cash. On the fishing grounds, on Smiley's trail, a down around the bud with a rising gale. On the fishing grounds, on Smiley's trail. Well, we ain't quit till we got fish for sale. Now, we ain't quit till we got fish for sale. Yeah, so pretty energetic song. I should have said smileys. I don't think I defined smileys for you. Um, smileys are a, um, a spring or Chinook salmon, um, generally over 20 pounds. And uh, they command an especially good price. So that's why the trollers um, call them smileys, because they put a smile on the face of the troller. So we're going to, uh, that was a, a, a song about fishing for salmon on the, on the outside, fishing primarily for uh, Chinook salmon. I'm going to do uh, another song, um, and this is more what we call inside, where the, the water's not quite so rough um, because of the protection of places like Vancouver Island. And this is a song written by uh, Lloyd Arntzen, who's a well-known jazz musician in Vancouver for many, many decades. But he was originally from Port Hardy, and this is a song he wrote for his father, uh, Arnt Arntzen. I think that's the key I do with it. From Port Hardy one morning I cast off my line. The sea was all smooth and the weather just fine. And out from Castle Rock I was headed away. Where the coral flats were all over the bay. Where the coral flats were all over the bay. It was just before dawn when I reached the fish around. So I lowered my holes and I let my lines down. I lit up my pipe and I waited and prayed. See the gold flash silver all over the bay. See the gold flash silver all over the bay. Well, the sun came up shining and so did the fish. Birdies were humming, what more could I wish? Then bells were all ringing, I was making it pay. Where the gold black silver all over the bay. Where the gold black silver all over the bay. Well, they've been all that morning till just afternoon. 
They're so hungry they strike out an old leather shoe. But this must be heaven to myself, I did say. There the cold flaps in all over the bay. Where the cold flaps in all over the bay. When I got home that evening, they asked what to do. And I showed them silver darlings to hundred and two. Well, you're the highliner, you're the best here today. Well, there's your doctors and lawyers and bankers and more, your wheelers and dealers with their big deals galore. But let me be a troller and a king for a day. Where the cocoa flash silver over the bay. Where the cocoa flash silver all over the bay. So Lord Johnson put that song together. I love it. <coughs> I think I'll have just a little drink of water. But when I was uh, fishing, I don't fish anymore. I've had a lot of career since, actually. But when I was fishing up in that area around Port Hardy, a most amazing thing happened to me. Um, I was trolling, and um, I noticed about a mile behind me, there was a small pod of orcas approaching. And usually when the orcas come into the area that you're trolling, you might as well give up because all the salmon that you're targeting are all going to go down the bottom and hide from the orcas because they are massive fish eaters, the uh, resident orcas. And, uh, but we just kept thought, well, maybe they'll bypass us and go somewhere else. So we kept on trolling and, um, and then they surfaced about, oh, say 50 meters behind the boat. And we thought, well, that's it. And, and they went under, and our, one of our bells rang, which indicated we had a fish. So we pulled it in, and there was no fish. Well, it was puzzling. And those orcas suddenly came up in about the same spot, about 50 meters behind our boat. And uh, <clears throat> so we let our lines down again, ding a ling a ling. Oh, hmm, it might still be biting. That's weird. We pulled up our line again, and the orcas back up on top. And we thought to ourselves, no, this cannot be happening. And we let our lines down again. And this time, just about all the bells rang, like a chorus of bells, ding -a -ling -a -ling -a -ling, like that. And we never saw the orcas again. And I'm convinced that they were teasing us. They were really, really smart. And uh, <laughs> so we thought, oh, and that, that's an amazing experience. And I've had a number like that with orcas. They're really quite amazing creatures. So I want to move on to uh, another form of catching salmon, and it's called purse staining. And uh, purse staining is done out of rather larger boats, um, many of them uh, more than 20 meters long. And um, a purse stain is a, is a net that can be cinched in the bottom to make like a cup or a purse. And <clears throat> the way that they fish is the the crew will stand up, if the weather is half decent, will stand up in, on the top of the wheelhouse as they cruise where they think there are salmon. And if they see jumpers, then that's an indication there's a school there. And so what will happen is that the, they'll let a skip, a power skip, or a little, a smallish boat with a powerful motor onto the back end of which is attached one end of the net. And that skip will take off this way and the mothership, the purse seining boat, will go off the other way and they'll make a circle around that school of fish and there's a, a line, a bunt line on the bottom and they'll pull this together and when that bag is formed and uh, closed and you see jumpers in the, in the bag, you'll hear the skipper shout, inside, meaning 
there's it's a good payday probably so i want to do a, a song i wrote <clears throat> Um, that relates to a geographic area on the inside passage. Uh, many of you are uh, familiar with the uh, Seymour Narrows, which is the passage uh, leading from Campbell River up to Johnston Strait and places like Port Hardy and Port Neville. Um, the, uh, the, the, they're rapids because the tide the islands between Vancouver Island and the mainland are all bunched up in that one area north of Campbell River, and they don't let the water through very easily. And the tides, because of the distances involved, arrive out of phase on either side of those islands. And so they generate these massive tide rapids that go through. Well, it was really bad in that main shipping area on uh, Seymour Narrow, so they blasted this thing called Ripple Rock. They blasted it out to make the passage safe for, uh, for ships. But most people don't know that there's a, a similar place on the mainland side, not on the Vancouver Island side where Seymour Narrows is, but on the mainland side. And um, people locally call it the Yucatan Rapids. And they're amazing. You can get up to 10 or 15 mile an hour 20 kilometer per hour um, tidal currents in there with uh, just um, with in one place, there's a huge whirlpool developed that they call the devil's hole. And um, <clears throat> on several occasions, um, I came down through the Euclata Rapids on a ship and um, heading home after a, a good fishing season. And so that's what this song is, is about. It's called Shooting Down the Euclatas. We're shooting down the Euclidons, a 10 knot surge running through the draws. <clears throat> well, Fred Baldy's watching how we fly. Our silvery load will turn to gold. Keep well away from the devil's hole, and I think we're not sure we feel an holiday. Well, all the crew were full of cheer. Got enough fish to make my year long winter in a warm and cozy place. But I won't forget the ones who lost. Them that paid a terrible cost. They fell forever from the ocean's grave. If you're married to see a better love to life, the old girl makes a demanding wife. Give your mind to everything she said. And if you work her soul, Chuck, with a love and skill and a bit of luck, we'll pay you in a hundred thousand ways. Remember the crew coming down gets you too drunk to pay the sea review. Found in twenty foot cats across the sound. I heard that when their engine failed, she gave to them no time to bail. Small as them all, not one was ever found. Oh, many a time we nailed the set. Many a time we grilled, and then I love to hear the skipper shout inside. Sockeye, Coco, Humpty Dog, West Coast, Linder, Charlotte, Bob. See, we're always running with the tide. And now we're shooting down the Euclidus. And that surf running through the drums. Well, Fred Paul is watching how we fly by. Our silvery load will turn to gold. Keep well away from the devil's hole. I make poor Dow sure be feeling high. When I make poor Dow sure be feeling high. Shooting down the Euclidus. The, the thing about this coast is that it's so got so much great imagery that uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an easy place to write about if you're a songwriter and have seen it. Um, one thing I one word that was in there that I thought I should explain: salt check. Uh, many, uh, I think, I suspect many of the students in Port Alberni know that that means the ocean, and it's from uh, the old trading jargon. That was the, we say lingua franca, the common language um, that people used in the, on the BC coast in the 19th century, in the 1800s. Um, they said that 
the uh, one of the most important things you could have on your person was a Chinook English dictionary because everybody spoke Chinook, but not everybody spoke English, particularly First Nations people. But they were so important to the survival of, of the early settlers here. <coughs> More water. So now I want to move on to gill netting. Gill netting is something that I did as well. All these gear types, I actually worked on on the uh, the gear. Um, and uh, gill netting is a little different kind of net. It's usually than the purseining. It's uh, done out of a smaller boat, um, often just a single person. And uh, it is bar a barrier net. Instead of, instead of being a purse, it makes a barrier that the fish swim into, get tangled in, and um, they get hauled aboard as a catch. Now, <clears throat> to make that barrier, uh, it has a bottom line that is leaded or weighted. So then it pulls the net down, but the top line has floats, which after the tradition, everyone calls corks. And, um, and uh, modern uh, uh, gill netters have what on the back, uh, back of, near the stern of the boat, have what's called a drum. It's a power drum, and that's what reels the net on when they're bringing it in. So they don't have to haul it by hand, like my father did um, when he first came to this coast many, many years ago, almost 100 years ago now. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, and uh, so there were um, uh, some amazing sights. But one of the, uh, the great places that I fished was the River's Inlet Run. Uh, back in the day when it was a big run. Unfortunately, it's not so big anymore. And uh, this is a song that uh, a friend of mine named Phil Thomas um, collected. He was uh, given a copy of what someone else had found on a cannery notice board written by a guy named uh, Ross Combers. And it's about the song of the sockeye. And this is about uh, fishing in Rivers Inlet when I was fishing there, uh, it's not that wide an inlet, you know, maybe a mile wide, and there would be a thousand gill netters there, and it looked like a city of lanterns at night. That was uh, quite pretty, but really, really hard for uh, towboats to navigate through the, ch the shipping channel as these gill netters were drifting all over the place, sleeping in their boats, hoping and dreaming of salmon. This is kind of about, about salmon fever. Hark to the song of the sockeye, like a siren's call of old. When it gets in your blood, you can't shake it. It's the same as the fever for gold. There's a hole in the deep sea coast by rivers inlets, a place I mean. And it's there that you'll find the old timer and also the floods green. All the boats head for there like the sockeye, and some are a joy to the eye, while others are simply disasters and ought to be left dry. They go to the different canneries, and before they can make one haul, it's 300 bucks per net rub and gas, which they hope to pay off before fall. Then it's off to the head of the inlet at 6 o'clock Sunday night. But when morning comes, and you've got about three, Prospects don't look very bright. Of course, there's always an alibi to account for a very poor run. The weather is wrong, the moon's not full, or the big tides will help the fish up. And the lot about dust when you're starting to doze, and you think you got a good night set. Into a roar and the armor blow as a tugboat tows into your bed. Well, so 
some of them think of the future while others have things to forget but most of us sit here and think of a school of sockeye hitting the net then when the season is over and you figure out what you have made you were better off working for wages no matter how low you were paid or the comforts of home are worth something so take it from me my friend frying can rub and no good will ruin your health in the end so hark to the song of the sockeye like a siren's call of old. When it gets in your blood, you can't shake it. It's the same as the fever or no. Yeah, so I have a lot of personal memories around the Rivers Inlet area. <clears throat> One of the most uh, uh, amazing ones I, I remember um, was uh, uh, having a, setting, making a set. I was exhausted. I made a set out in front of a place called Calvert Island, just south of Calvert Island, out in the mouth of Rivers Inlet. And, um, and I saw this strange thing rise up in the water. Um, it didn't roll like a whale. It didn't leap like a fish. It kind of came out of the water and went down. And it was about, you know, several hundred meters, maybe half a, kilometer behind me and um, I wondered what it was and then uh, a few minutes later it came up again but just about 20 meters off the stern of my boat and it was two dolphins mating and um, they you know with that wicked smile on their faces it looked like they had they were having a lot of fun and so that figures in this song that I'm going to do um, the song I wrote which I call the Gil Netter song some people call it Counting corks, and other people call it that dolphin nookie song. But anyway, just before um, I say counting corks, I said when I was telling you about the gill net, net, the, how it's structured with floats on the top, those corks, um, <clears throat> as long as they're not filled up with some junk, if those corks start disappearing beneath the water, it's a good sign that you've got lots of fish in your net. So, so that's what this song is about. Well, the deck is clear and ready, and the glass is full and steady. And now we're out to Gilnet in Queen Charlotte Strait. And voices on the radio say soon have begun to shoot. The Peggy Big is pulled in for me. Well, I'm a setting on the spot where several years ago I got My neck's so full of sock, I had my corks and disappeared. See the jumper to the right, mine's the only boat in sight. And once again, my drum rolls out the gear. Oh, I love to count those corks, go up, down, down, down. Salmon running by the time, I love them. Try to make a little big on a gill net boat. Well, sometimes the fish don't show, or prices are just too darn low. No one seems to care if you're a Ah, uh, but when for all my trying, I've got to be seen to feed sea lions, or fill my net with dog fish and their beady little eyes. I'll dream of that big payoff. I know it can't be way up, or I'll scare myself about the job inside. Oh, I'd love to count those corks going down, down, down. Salmon running by the time I love every mouth. Rolling out my neck, gonna make a highlights, and then I'll count those corks going down. Off the stern quarter rising straight out of the water. 
I see two dolphins standing high upon their tail. How they look so sweet and silly, mating belly to white belly. Cause from I got high, they wear those crazy smiles. As they sink back out of sight, making love into the night. In a bed that is a million miles away. But you know that I'm no fish kind of gets me wishing that I had myself my sweetheart with me here. Who would love to count those corks going down, down, down? Seven running by the tub, she loved every pound. Rolling up my neck, following the high line set. And then I'll count those corks going down, down, down. Yes, then we'll count those corks going down, down, down. We'd love to count those corks going down. Go Netter song. Um, you know, I'm thinking about some other things, uh, some other images that I saw when I was a, a gillnet fisherman, and an experience that I had. Uh, when I was a gill netter, I was also a, a diver. And so um, often, back then, um, one could dive and pick abalone. Um, they called them the chicken of the sea at the time. Now they're so scarce, they're so vulnerable to scuba divers that you can't harvest them anymore, I think, except for maybe a special license. <clears throat> but anyway, I got a small bag of uh, abalone that I picked off the bottom and uh, came back to the float where we had a bunch of uh, gill netter boats tied up um, during a, a couple day closure. Typically they would open the, the fishing from say Sunday evening to uh, Friday afternoon. And then uh, people had about two days to kind of uh, clean themselves up in their boats and, and, um, and also give the fish a break to let some of them go up to spawn, what, what fisheries biologists call escapement. These fish would escape the fishing pressure. But back on this float, I brought these the abalone up and this uh, very lovely nisei, um, a, a Japanese Canadian man, cooked them. And um, I, I realized that, you know, he was one of those fishermen who at the beginning of the Second World War, had their boats taken away from them, where they, they, the, uh, the government decided that they were some kind of uh, military risk because of their ethnicity. Uh, a really terrible racist thing to do because um, they were ardent Canadians and, and good fishermen, and, and not just fishermen, all kinds of, uh, most Japanese folks were sent away to internment camps and their, the assets they spend their lives building up were taken away from them or sold at, at rock bottom prices to opportunistic buyers. Um, so it was really, really sad, um, but I was um, really happy to see that this uh, older fellow had, had found his way back into the fishing industry. <clears throat> so anyway, um, by the way, his, his uh, recipe was fantastic. Okay, um, like I said, the conservation and um, uh, management of salmon has been a really terrible, terrible problem. Um, we, we've got several intersecting things that cause, uh, have caused the depletion of salmon. Um, habitat loss through um, development or logging or uh, damage to streams, all that kind of thing. Then um, um, ocean survival, what they call ocean survival, is, has also been a big issue. Uh, partly, it, some people relate to um, ocean warming. Um, at times, that's very true because those warm currents will pick up um, tro more tropical fish like mackerel who feed on the outbound salmon and cause... Uh, cause a, a big depletion in their stocks that way. Also, I um, um, was really happy to hear that the Ministry of Fisheries is going to um, uh, take out uh, the open 
net fish farms because the lice problem that they um, are a part of has really caused a lot of um, a lot of loss of fish too. They get these little lice on them, and within a matter of weeks, these small smolts, these small juvenile salmon will die. Um, so it's been it's been hard for a lot of folks who have been forced out of the fishing industry. I should say, you know, fishing pressure too has been a problem. Um, that um, uh, sometimes the stocks haven't man been managed as well as they could for a variety of reasons. Um, but the, um, these issues have driven a lot of uh, people out of the fishing industry who, whose families have been in it for generations. And I, I'm thinking of a, of a friend of mine. Um, at one point in my life, I drove cab. And this friend and I um, would have fun sometimes comparing how similar trolling for salmon was to driving a cab in the city where you trolled down the streets for for fairs or you know that kind of thing but anyway this is this is a song that that i wrote um uh, kind of it's in his voice and it's kind of a lament for the loss of his life as a as a fisherman it's called asphalt sea once i was a fisherman Red the tide and wind. Now I drive a taxi cab. Wonder how I've sinned. It made me have to sell my boat. It's such a rotten deal. Farewell to the ocean line. I'm stuck behind the wheel. Oh, 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 once I was a fisherman, then I felt so free. Now I drive a taxi cab on a natural sea. Rolling down the flat gray streets, looking for a fair. No sun shining in my face, only a headlight's glare. Goodbye, dolphin, goodbye, whale. Raven and eagle, too. Hello, pigeon and the crow. Now I'm more like you. Oh, oh, once I was a fisherman, then I felt so free. Now I drive a taxi cab on the Nashville Sea. Might want to do something. Yeah. On a Nashville sea, 
catching fish it's about uh, processing them as well and um, a friend of mine's written a pretty good song about that kind of thing um, and um, uh, you know they there used to be canneries all over the coast and it was a major part of how these small communities around the coast survived <clears throat> um, they would have what we call a seasonal round where they would they would uh, people would uh, go fishing and, and uh, work in canneries during the summer, and then in, during the autumn and spring uh, stormy season, they would be log salvagers and um, do that kind of thing. They managed, and, and maybe in the winter or even in, in the summer and uh, spring and, and autumn as well, they they would go logging in what we call jeppo logging outfits, small small logging outfits that uh, had uh, areas to cut wood. Anyway, but canneries were a really, really important part of, of uh, what went on. And uh, my friend Linda Chobotuck worked as a student. She worked in a cannery for a while and um, wrote this really fine song called Canning Salmon. The guys on the dock lays around, raise the forklift. And sass the floor and lady till it's time for their tea. Then they sit at the table by the window that opens, and they get paid a buck more an hour than me. High is the smell, low is the pay. All are the hours, why do we stay? Somewhere outside, a whole summer slips away while we're stuck in here canning salmon. First we can spring, so heavy our arms ache. Then we do sockeye, which we pack the bees. Then we do cakes that are smashed up and rotten, so they're packed up in pound cans and sent overseas. High is the smell, low is the pay, all are the hours, why do we stay? Somewhere outside a whole summer slips away, while we're stuck in here canning summer. Last night we were waiting for a boat on the Fraser, so they kept us in line just as standing around. We didn't know that outside on the river, the boat had flipped over and two men had drowned. High is the cost, low is the pay, long are the hours, why do we stay? Somewhere outside a whole summer slips away, we're stuck in the air canning salmon. We're stuck in here, can salmon. <clears throat> yeah, so we're going to leave um, salmon now, which are, the, of course, like I said, the, the dominant part of the fishing industry. But there are other um, important parts too, the herring and the halibut and ground fish. Um, I'm not sure about the, how our time is working out, but I suspect that we'll we we'll just do a little bit about herring and halibut. And uh, the trawlers way out in the high seas and their big boats, we'll, we'll leave them to later. So um, I want to talk about herring. Herring is a, a small fish, many of you know that. Um, there are many herring-like fish on the, on the west coast. There's uh, herring and smelts and oolicans and pilchards um, and more. But herring is a particular, um, particular importance. It's been hugely important to First Nations for thousands and thousands of years because the herring come in and they basically coat the beaches with spawn and the eggs in that spawn are extremely nutritious and the First Nations folks would, would uh, harvest kelp 
that um, that the uh, herring spawned on, and they would actually it was so desired that they could sell it to uh, to other uh, people who didn't have access to that resource. And uh, the herring is uh, another kind of keystone species where they um, they the ones that um, they eat tiny fish and plankton. Yet they themselves um, feed uh, important creatures, especially um, salmon. Um, I'm thinking in particular of um, Chinook and sockeye and um, chum salmon are dependent on uh, on, the, on the herring resource. <clears throat> so uh, what uh, people usually catch herring with nets and um, the uh, uh, nets, either gill net, a fine mesh gill net, the, uh, a different size of, of mesh, uh, an opening in the net, um, very fine, and it can be it done gill netting or purse seining. And um, uh, sometimes the, uh, the uh, catches have been huge. The, uh, the herring are most important in the uh, commercial market for the roe. And the, the roe is a, is a delicacy that's very much prized by Japanese folks and um, on sushi. And so if you go to a sushi restaurant, you'll be um, really rewarded if you have some salmon roe on, uh, on the sushi, really excellent, uh, excellent food. So anyway, um, I'm not gonna do a song about actual herring fishing, but I'm gonna do a song about um, herring processing and the out, uh, out beyond you folks in Port Alberni is, is uh, Tofino and years ago they had a, a herring processing plant out there and it was designed primarily to separate herring from from their row the row of the eggs and um, and uh, ship those off to Japan and the the herring bodies themselves would become feed stock for various things uh, and um, including fish farms. Uh, but anyway, um, a friend of mine, Bob Bosson, wrote a, a fun song uh, about people working in that plant. If any of you have been out to Tofino, there's a wonderful bakery out there. And um, the lady who owns that bakery, um, she worked on the herring lines. And she was a good friend of Bob's. And, um, and after they'd finished a shift, they'd all congregate together at the, uh, the McQuinna Hotel in, in Tofino, have a drink and, and uh, talk all kinds of stuff. And uh, so Bob wrote this, this uh, fun song called the Tofino Herring Shanty. Now I think some people might know what a shanty is. It's a call and response work song. And so um, if you feel like it, you can um, maybe tie into to the call and response part of it, where I say, uh, whatever I say. <laughs> it's hard to remember what the lyric is without singing it. Anyway, we're gonna do the Tofino herring shanty. Uh, yeah, pretty little silver fishes, is, a, is one of the lines. Oh, the herring fleets a city afloat upon the sea. Oh, the fish off girl. Oh, the rain's coming down and the wind's southeast. Pretty little silver fishes. Or buggers in their tents on Chesterman Beach. Oh, the fish off girl. When the fish come in, it's a silver river. Pretty little silver fishes. When the boys come in, it's the hotel to win. Oh, the fish off girls. Tell me it's pull and squeeze and pull and squeeze. Pretty Silver fishes, oh, it's pull and squeeze and pull and squeeze. Oh, the fish up girls, fairy, 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 fairy. Before I die, I would have to go. Pretty little silver fishes, I would join. 
such huge fish. I, I remember a friend of my father's, uh, his idea of a fun thing to do was go out into the Gulf of Alaska on a boat, bouncing around in horrible weather, catching these giant halibut, some of which would weigh over 200 kilos. And they were so big and their tails were so powerful, they'd actually shoot them before they pulled them on the deck. <laughs> that was a really wild kind of fishery. But anyway, um, I, I did... Before we close off, I think um, I'd like to do something about shellfish too, because that's a that's been a hugely important staple for thousands of years on this coast, and um, uh, we have oysters and mussels and various kinds of clams and other things that that um, um, we still have evidence of how important they have been in the form of of uh, what are called middens. M-I-D-D-E-N-S, middens, that um, have accumulated over the centuries in various important sites, uh, harvesting sites that First Nations people use. And um, <clears throat> um, they, you know, one of the things that my wife and I, when we go kayaking, love to do is, is go harvest some shellfish and cook them on the beach. Um, and that becomes a staple for us when we're out kayak camping. So it's um, the uh, I guess the, the thing to do is is remember though that that pollution is problematic for for shellfish. And um, I wrote this song called "When the Tide Goes Out, the Table Is Set," which is a First Nations saying it's not my original song but or saint saying but it, it it was so evocative that I think it's been a real gift from First Nations to the rest of us to appreciate the intertidal zone and uh, something that we can um, all partake in in protecting because it's a, a rich and important resource not just for the shellfish but for for juvenile fish to grow up in and and uh, and be part of our, our rich ecology. So this is called When the Tide Goes Out. Along the shore is where life began, and by sea and born by land, under the sun and the moon's coming. Down through the ages feeding men, oh, when the tide goes out, the table is set and the sea serves up her bounty. Come with me, one of the sands. 